Welcome to this sermon from Silver Lake Baptist Church. Our mission is to celebrate the greatness of God with all we are for the joy, hope, and renewal of our community. We are so glad you have chosen to listen to our message. We pray you will be blessed by your time with us today. I have a special friend that I'm going to bring out to uh, help illustrate the beginning of this morning's message. But before I bring him out, I want to warn everyone. Some of you probably have at least lukewarm feelings for me, and you're going to like me a little less. Probably about 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, because there's something this guy does that for some reason just sticks in your mind. And so he's broadly hated by my family members. Um, but we'll see. I'm going to bring him over by the microphone. This is the problem. So he, he likes to party. Um, unfortunately, that song is way more catchy than it might seem at first. So periodically, we'll be driving down the road, and one of the kids will say, we're going to a party, party. And everybody else will be like, stop it. I don't want to hear that thing ever again. But 10 minutes later, the very person who was saying stop it is singing the song. So. The point is, with this guy, he's ready for a party. And I want you to think about a time you were ready for a party. One of the first questions we have to answer when we're getting ready for a party is, who are we going to invite to this party? And you have all kinds of factors to consider as you're preparing those invitations. How much space do I have? How much food can we buy? How much of everything I need to facilitate this party can I accommodate? And then you, you come up with a number, and then you have to take your friends list and family list and match it up with that number, right? And there's the difficulty of, there are certain people who are automatically invited to everything, right? For instance, if you have children, you're probably not gonna have a party and ignore your kids, right? So those numbers are automatically taken away from the list. And then you have certain friends who've been there your whole life, poof, automatically in. And so pretty soon you just have this, this small number of people left that you can invite and you have to juggle them and figure it all out well jesus has this epic eternal party that he's going to throw and he doesn't have the same constraints that you and i have and i want us to see that so as we've been in acts you may not have noticed this but for the past several months we've been looking at less than a year of actual time did you notice that we're looking at a really compressed timeline as it normally relates to sunday morning preaching. There are sermons that you'll come and hear, and we go through 400 years, right, in one hour. Boom. But in Acts, we've done kind of the opposite. We're traveling at almost the same speed as the events that we're reading about. Not exactly, but pretty close, much more closely than we normally would. And in doing that, we're focusing on such a tiny window that I think there's a little concern that we missed the bigger, broader picture. So we're going to look at the, really quickly here, the bigger, broader picture that this all fits into. What's going on in Acts? And it starts in the very first book in your Bible, in Genesis chapter 12. God makes a promise to this guy. And the promise is to a guy named Abram that he's going to make him a blessing to all the families of the earth. Or some of your Bibles may say all the nations of the earth. The point is, everybody's going to be invited to this party that God's going to throw. Not just people from a certain class or a certain demographic. Everybody is going to be invited. All peoples are going to be blessed through what God's going to do through Abram. And then in Matthew, Jesus tells the story, it's a parable of a guy who's getting ready to have a bridal party for his son, a wedding party for his son. And do you remember what happens in that story? So he has some people he's invited who are supposed to be at this wedding party and they don't want to come. Unimaginable, right? So he says, okay, here's what we're going to do. Just go out and invite passers-by. Whoever comes by, invite them to come and be a part of this big celebration of this wedding that's going to take place. And the wedding that's going to take place is a wedding between Christ and his church. And God's calling us to invite everybody to this wedding party that's going to last into eternity. 
And then it touches the, the section of history we're in. Do you remember Acts 1.8 that we started this whole thing? The thing about the apostles being witnesses to what Christ had done. Who did Jesus say they would be witnesses to? Judea, Samaria, and eventually to the ends of the earth. Everybody. And then finally we get to the end of the book in Revelation. And I'm going to actually read this for you in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. This is where the party is headed. This is why the apostles were called to be witnesses. They sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. That's the party that you and I are headed to. A party where God has taken people out of every people group, every demographic, to celebrate who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Keep that in mind as you open your Bibles to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. And as you're turning to Acts chapter 6, I'm going to pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that you've given us here this morning. We thank you for your word and these precious promises that start at the beginning of the book and continue through the end of the book, that one day there will be a unified group of people brought together out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation to celebrate Jesus Christ, to rejoice in the salvation that has been purchased for us through his blood. And we look forward to that day, Lord. We want to live lives that reflect the truth of those promises. So help us this morning as we read these words and we challenge some of our own traditional thoughts. Would you work in our hearts? Would you help us to honestly live out a life that reflects who you are and what you're doing in the time that you give us here on earth? Thank you for this truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, in Acts chapter 6, we read, Now in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. So there's a few things that aren't immediately apparent, I think, to most of us. So there's the Hebrews and the Hellenists. That's kind of a, an atypical way of talking about the people who came from Jewish roots and everybody else. Kind of like a them and an us for the Jews. So the, Helen is, is normally a way of referring to Greeks, but it doesn't literally only mean people from Greece, right? This is everybody who's not Jewish and the Jews. And so in the early church, the church is growing. It says the number of disciples was multiplying, but there began to be some friction. There was a complaint. And maybe you've experienced that. Maybe you've been a part of a church that seemed good and it was growing and everything looked great, but then there was some friction. There was a point of contention. That's because there are people in churches, and where there are groups of people, there will be friction, there will be contentions. In this case, there's kind of two factions, the people who were Jewish and everybody else. And the reason for the friction? The widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. At this time, it was very difficult to survive as a widow. And so the widows were depending on daily provision of food from the church. So that sounds amazing, right? I would like to be a part of a church that is so sensitive to the needs of the people around them that when there are widows who are starving, the church takes it upon itself to provide this daily distribution of food. That's right. That's a good thing to do. I'm excited to be a part of that. The problem is only the Jewish kids, the Jewish widows, are getting fed. And so the people who weren't Jews are being neglected. The widows who are not Jewish root widows are being neglected in the distribution of food. Do you see how that might be a source of friction? It's a legitimate complaint. It's a concern. It's like if we were in the context of our church to have a, a regular distribution of food or any other tangible need being met that is a result of all of our collective giving, but we omit a certain group of people from the benefits. That's not right. That's not a good thing to do. And so people are being offended. People are concerned. People are complaining. And there's something that I want to point out here because I think it's, there's a direct parallel in our society today. Is a church that is growing and serving automatically a healthy church? Because I think we operate under that assumption often. If I see a church and the campus is growing and there's more cars in the parking lot, that's a good sign. 
If I step inside that church and find that they're serving their community and serving one another, again, that's a great sign. But are those two great signs all that I should be looking for in a church? And I think this clearly shows us the answer is no. This church is growing. It says multiplying. This church is serving. They're daily providing food for widows. But even though both these things are true, they're not entirely healthy. They are not living out the picture that we just painted from all of Scripture of God redeeming people from all walks of life. They're living as if only the Jews are worthy of the special attention, the special service, the distribution of food. So growth and service are not the only signs of a healthy church. Growth and service are not the only signs of a healthy church. And I think that sparks questions for us. If there's more to it, what else do we need to do? What else do we need to be to be a healthy church? And we're going to see those over and over again in the book of Acts. The first one is coming right up in verse 2. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Okay, so the twelve. That sounds like a pretty official title. Who is the twelve? It's the apostles. It's the leadership of the early church. And they say, here's what we have to do, guys. Come together. It's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. I think for most of us, at least for me, if I'm honest, when I read those words at the beginning, it sounds a little snobby. It's not good for me to help those hungry people because I have something else to do. And if we just read this verse without the rest of the context, I think it's easy to, to fall into considering it that way. It's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. But look at the next verse. I think it helps us out. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So they're recognizing something needs to be done. And this is one difference between the early church, the healthy church, and what I think is most common in churches today. When you are confronted with something that you're doing wrong, what is the natural response? To be defensive? To explain the reason for why we're doing things? Well, you know, the Jews were God's people, so I'm sorry you're hungry, but you're going to just have to deal with it. That's our normal response to criticism, to complaints. Their response was, hey, this is wrong. We need to do something differently. We need to fix our behavior. And not only do we need to fix our behavior, but we need to fix our behavior God's way. So look, at, care, look carefully again at verse 3. Men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Who are they selecting to take care of this problem? Any random person off the street who might be able to help? No. They're using God's standards for leaders of his people. In a very early form, one of the earliest forms we see in the New Testament church. And so what are the criteria? They have to have a good reputation. They have to be full of the Holy Spirit. And they have to be wise. Those are the three big things that we see. And I think it's really important. This is another thing that we struggle with, I think, in modern church life. To recognize God's standards and implement those. Because when we have a difficulty, what is the natural human reaction? If, if we're going to tackle this problem, we're going to look for the, the highest recruit, right? If it's football, we want the five-star recruit out of the best school because that's the best representative for our team. If it involves public speaking, we want the most dynamic, popular public speaker we can pull in. If it has to do with leadership, we want the CEO of the biggest company with the highest revenue, right? That's how we do things. But God's economy doesn't always match up with that. He defines competence differently than we do. Okay, so again, look at them. Reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, and wisdom. Being full of the Holy Spirit is an indicator, first of all, that, that they're a real Christian, right? You don't get the Holy Spirit any other way. The way you become full of the Holy Spirit is by being a child of God through Jesus Christ. So they're going to be Christians who have good reputations and have demonstrated wisdom a track record of their, their life matching up with what it is that they're saying. And that's the next point in your outline. Prioritizing God-given qualifiers sometimes means excluding competent, popular people. Prioritizing God-given qualifiers sometimes means excluding competent, popular people. For instance, in a church, it's not necessarily the smartest approach to have a vote on the most popular person and make that person your pastor. 
Does that make sense? There are people who are popular who should not be pastors. There are even people who are competent who should not be pastors. And there's a book, I'm not going to assign this as homework, but I'm going to encourage you to read it if it's something you're interested in. It's by a man named John Piper, and the title is Brothers, We Are Not Professionals. And it's a thick, heavy book with lots of scripture references, but it's a cry from one pastor's heart to his fellow pastors saying, our ministry is not about building our resume, basically. Our conduct, our character is more important than the resume we're building as pastors. And so if you're interested in Christian leadership, if you're interested in what it should like, look like to be a pastor, I encourage you to read that. Brothers, we are not professionals. And I understand the temptation. I've, I've sat in meetings where we're discussing church hirings and firings, and there, there absolutely is a bias in all of our hearts towards who looks like the best candidate, who seems to be the most competent, who seems to be the most polished speaker. And I don't think we often spend as much time as we ought on character issues, on what is their knowledge of Scripture, the things that God calls important. How does their lifestyle match up with that knowledge of Scripture? These are the critical things that we should be evaluating, more so than what they look like and how polished they sound. The critical things are the things that God gives us. And there's a recent example of this that's been playing out over the past several months at a big church called Willow Creek. It, it was, at one time, the biggest evangelical church in the United States. And they had as competent, as popular a leader as you could possibly have, but now the whole church is falling apart. Their entire elder board resigned. Their new pastor resigned. Their new teaching pastor resigned. It's one of those churches that has multiple pastors because it's so big. But both the executive pastor and the new teaching pastor have resigned as a result of their failure to manage the conduct of the previous pastor, who was very competent and very well-liked and very well-known. And that is a trap that we can fall into. Just because somebody sounds good and looks popular and attracts a following is not an indication that they're equipped to be a leader in God's church. And so they start from the beginning with the desire to pick someone who is full of the Holy Spirit, who has a good reputation, and is wise. And even once we've made the selection, we need to stay sensitive to the possibility that they are human beings and things change. That guy who, who did demonstrate a good reputation, who did indicate evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit, who did appear to be wise, sometimes makes foolish decisions. So just because at one point in your life you were equipped and prepared to be a leader of God's people doesn't mean you permanently get the auto exemption for the rest of your life. That's why we should have elders who hold one another accountable. Church families who hold their elders accountable. Because every single one of us is human and every single one of us is prone to sin. And imagine the danger in this situation. If you are the means of survival for someone and you don't have sound character, can you imagine the problems that could creep into the church? So from the beginning, they established we're going to have these guidelines about who's going to be providing the food to the folks who need the food. Prioritizing God-given qualifiers sometimes means excluding competent, popular people. So if the 12, the apostles, are not going to be serving food, which seems like a, a real pressing need, they said it wasn't desirable for them to do that, what's going to happen? It's, why are these seven guys doing it instead? Look at verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And here you see verses 2 and 4 match up and link together. And we see they weren't being snobbish. They weren't too good to wait tables. They had a different God-given task. And they were 100% committed to fulfilling that God-given task. And that God-given task for them is devotion to prayer and devotion to the ministry of the Word of God. And how important it is for us that they did that. Because they did that, the church had a solid early foundation. Because they did that, you have your New Testament in your Bible. God called them to a specific task for a specific time period, and they needed to do that, even though there was something of critical importance needing to be done. And so they made sure that the church took care of it, they appointed sound men to take care of it, but they were going to stick with their God-given task. And the importance of this is something that I continue to see the, the older I get and the longer I've walked with the Lord. I see that in our lives, we are likely to be very fractured people. And what I mean by that is we have many demands on our time. And if you're like me, you want to be good at all these things, right? So 
If I want to be a good father, that requires a significant investment of time. If I want to be a good husband, that requires a significant investment of time. If I want to be a good boss at work, that requires a significant investment of time. And those are just like my main missions in life. If I want to be a good pastor, that requires a significant investment of time. Again, a main mission in my life. But what if I want to have a hobby? What if I want to be knowledgeable on computer programming in my spare time? That requires a significant investment of time. What if I want to be a good friend? All these things are pulling each of us in different directions. We can only be excellent at a few things. And each of us needs to balance our time and our rest schedule and the way we eat and the way we take care of ourselves so that we can devote the best of who we are to the things that God's called us to do. If I invest all my time in programming computers when God called me to be a pastor, I'm missing the mark. There may be another guy that God has called to be a computer programmer with his life, and that's why God put him here. And if I'm wasting my time trying to be like him, I'm not being the man that God called me to be. So all of us, and I'm not going to speak into each of your life what it is, because I don't know, God hasn't revealed that to me, all of us have specific tasks from God, and those have to be our priorities. That's what we see the apostles doing. There's a critical need. There are people who are hungry, who are not being fed, but they still say, I'm going to take care of that need, but that's not going to be my priority. That's not what God called me to do. I'm going to keep doing the thing that God called me to do. Prioritizing God-given tasks sometimes means excluding good, important activities. I will have to say no, even to things that are good things, even to things that are important things, to honor God's call on my life. There are times when I have to say no to something I'd really, really like to do in order to fulfill what God has called me to do. And those are tough decisions, right? I think we often talk about getting rid of our vices, right? It makes sense that I'm not going to waste time on drinking and gambling and doing drugs, all that stuff, if I'm pursuing Jesus Christ. But sometimes I also have to say no to things that are actually good, things that are actually important because they're not the best. They're not the thing that God called me to do. And so it's just making sense of the priorities God has assigned to our lives. So after they deliver that solution, what's the reaction of the early church? Look at verse 5. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Does that name sound familiar, Stephen? It will pretty soon if it doesn't. And Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. Why do they mention a proselyte from Antioch? What's a proselyte even? Someone who has converted, right? So there was a huge tradition in the church because of where it started in Jerusalem that most of these guys are Jews. So when someone isn't, they make a big deal out of it. That's why I think it's listed this way. This guy's from Syria and he received the work of God in his life and he became a Christian and not just a Christian, but now he's a leader in the early church whom they set before the apostles and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Okay. There's something I want us to notice here. So they, these are God's people, right? The requirement to be on this list was that you be full of the Holy Spirit. So the church as a body recognized all of these men as being God's people, as being Christians, as being full of the Holy Spirit, as being wise, as having good reputations. They're being set apart to do something God wants them to do. It's pretty clear through the rest of the Bible that if someone's hungry, if there's a widow in need, that God's people should be fulfilling that need, right? Do you get that impression from reading the rest of the Bible? It's a big deal to God that we take care of widows and orphans. And so we have God's kids doing God's thing, but there's still something missing. What do they do in verse 6? They set them before the apostles and prayed and laid hands on them. They asked for God's intervention in the lives of these men to equip them to do the thing that he's calling them to do. That's something I think we miss too sometimes. You can have really good intentions that match up with God's word. You can be God's kid. But if you step out on your own to try to do God's work without prayer cover, without the recognition of your local church family, the accountability to the local church family, the support of the local church family, you're setting yourself up for failure. And they didn't do that here. They recognize that God's people require God's provision to accomplish God's purposes. God's people require God's provision to accomplish God's purposes. 
Just because you give it a good idea one day that you're going to go out and, and feed the widows of Everett doesn't mean that it's naturally going to work. God is in charge of every event of your life, including the feeding of the widows. So let's go to him with that plan. Let's seek his people and their involvement and their input. Pray and ask for his intervention in what you're setting out to do. God's people require God's provision to accomplish God's purposes. The first six verses define a problem and the solution to the problem. So the problem is we've got one group of widows being fed and one group of widows not being fed. And they're in the same church. And that's awkward. That's difficult. It causes offense. It's not a fair telling of God's story. Right? We saw at the beginning of this message what God's story looks like. It looks like people from every walk of life being called in and invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb, to this eternal celebration of who Jesus is and what he's done. But his church in its very earliest days is making that look like a lie. The only people who are invited to this feast are the Jews. Do you think we've matured beyond that point? In many ways, we haven't. And I want us to see that in America today, there are still divides that sometimes extend into the church. And when that happens, we're not telling the same story that God tells us to share with the world. We're not being the Acts 1-8 kind of witnesses that we're called to be. And I think if I were to ask, if we took a quick informal poll, what's the dividing line in America today? We would probably say race, right? There's black and white and people not getting along with one another and all kinds of uh, things that you can see on the news that are evidence of people because of their race hating one another. But I want to offer to you the suggestion that both in Acts, what we're reading this morning, and in our world today, the race isn't really the big driver of the separation. It's a cultural difference. And here's where we'll see it first in Acts. There are Jews and there are Greeks. They lived right next to each other. Their skin color would have been the same. The city on their mail would have been the same. The difference was cultural. The Jews had been set apart as God's people. They were following all kinds of dietary restrictions. They were worshiping in a different way than the people around them. And so they were marked as different. And internally, that created pride. We're better than all those other people. And to the rest of the world, they were weirdos. You don't eat bacon? What's wrong with you people? So there's this difference. No matter which side of it you're on, there's room for division. And yes, it's true that there are cultural differences in America between white people and brown people and black people and yellow people, but those are not the biggest cultural distinctions. There are many black people in my life who you, you set us up in the living room and we're going to get along better than a lot of white people that I know, right? Because our culture is different. We share a culture that is more important to us than our racial culture. And the big question is, where does your identity come from? And the problem that was diagnosed by Luke in the early church was that they were still living out their little racial culture as opposed to the bigger Jesus culture. And if Christians are going to make a difference in a world that is divided by racial culture, we need to live the same way. We need to say that the Jesus culture is more important to me than whatever racial culture I inherited by virtue of my birth. I have white skin because a long time ago, some people in Northern Europeans decided to have a kid. And that kid was my great-great-great-grandpa. Some of you have different colors of skin because of wherever your great-great-grandpa or your great-great-grandma lived. None of that means anything in comparison with who Jesus Christ is and what he's done. And if you've become a child of God through Jesus Christ, whose identity did you take on? The Bible says this on page after page after page. Your identity is hidden with Christ in God. You're a new person. So your new culture is the culture of heaven, not the culture of your skin color. And if we can live that way, it means that the Jewish widows get fed, the Greek widows get fed, the black widows get fed, the white widows get fed. And the big issue is not what color their skin is or what their racial makeup is, but their need. Because Jesus said to meet the need. He didn't say meet the need of the people who look like you, talk like you, walk like you. 
these people address that because they recognize they weren't telling God's story. They're telling lies about who God is through their behavior. If I only take care of people who look like me, I'm not sharing with the world what God looks like. And what was the result? That's what we get to see in verse 7. If we can live like that, how does the world change? Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. So something new happens in that last verse. The church has been growing. It it seems like somebody stepped on the gas here in verse 7. That's the impression I get. The word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, which is where they've been conducting their ministry. So tons of people are coming to Christ. But what's the last part say? A great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. The leaders of the Jewish synagogues are being converted to Christianity. It's almost like they had this story in the back of their mind somewhere about what God was doing, and they saw the early church matching up with that story, where they hadn't before. Something is new, something is different, something has changed. And it's, they're not just marching through the beat of a service. They're not just doing God's service with human standards. They're making the service of God match up with the standards of God. And the same call is extended to us today. Are we doing God's things God's way? Or are we putting on a show every Sunday that kind of looks like what God wanted us to do, but we're forcing our story into it? There's a big difference. God's service, done according to God's standards, reveals God's salvation. These priests who are coming to faith in Christ, the disciples multiplying greatly, is not happening because of a charismatic, attractive leader. It's not happening because suddenly they got the exact right words to speak at the exact right time. It's happening because they're being obedient to God, and God is working through their obedience to save souls. No matter how pretty you get, no matter how handsome you get, no matter how smart you get, no matter how polished your message is, you cannot save people from hell. Only God can do that, and he does it by his Holy Spirit working in our lives. This story reveals to us that that happens most often when people are obedient to God's call, when there's a faithful retelling of his story. If you share the gospel with someone, but your life doesn't match up with the gospel, it's really hard to hear the message that you're sharing. If I'm a racist, but I'm telling you how much Jesus loves everybody, it's hard to hear how much Jesus loves everybody. But if I'm committed to telling Jesus' story Jesus' way, you'll see Jesus. You'll see who Jesus is and what he's done and why he did it. God's service, done according to God's standards, reveals God's salvation. And this is why we don't need to have the prettiest person up here, the most popular person up here, not even the smartest person up here. We need to look for leaders who are obedient, who are faithful, who are committed to telling God's story God's way. And when God's church is led by people who are doing things God's way, we'll see God at work. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the example of these leaders in the early church who were humble enough to admit when they got it wrong. And not just admit that they got it wrong, but to seek a better way of doing things. Thank you for their faithfulness to tell your story your way. And help us here at Silver Lake, Lord, to never get so wrapped up in our programs or activities or the things we're doing that we miss the bigger story. Help us to always remember what it is that you've called us to bear witness to. Help us to remember that Jesus Christ came into this world and lived a sinless life to pay the price for our sin. That everybody of every race and people and tribe and tongue might understand that there's hope for them in Jesus Christ. Lord, we look forward to the day when we will be gathered together with a throng of people of every color, speaking all kinds of different languages, drawn together because they love you because they're thankful for the deliverance that you've provided through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And Lord, please help us to carry that message with us everywhere we go, a message that we can carry with sincerity if we remember who it is and what he did. We love you and thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more about us, check out our website at www.silverlakebaptist.org.